Welcome back to the Red Line Podcast. Today we are joined by a special guest, 10-year ten, ten NFL vet from NC State guard, Ted Larson. Ted, how are you today? I'm doing good. Thank you. And Alex, how are you? Doing all right. Hanging in there. I hope, uh, obviously, very happy to have uh, Ted on. First guest for me and first guest in a while for you guys. Yeah. So, Ted, you just graduated from Harvard last week, right? For business, uh, in, a, in, a, in a matter of uh, sort of, it wasn't. It was just a program they had with uh, athletes for the semester, where you could uh, go there and and you they pair you up with a mentor and you take you take a couple classes and and you kind of just run through the program. It's kind of like a light version of business school, but uh, it was it was still cool to to experience it. Well, awesome! Congratulations. Thank you. You know, it's something like an avenue for, you know, sometimes NFL plays don't get the best rap, so to say, off season, whatever. Obviously, you're going to Harvard taking, you know, some kind of program. That's awesome. But, uh, Ted, you'd be surprised. We have more in common than you think. Uh, at one point, uh, I just got my boater's license down in Florida to write jet skis. And I believe you were a licensed boater right now or at some point in Florida. But I was reading uh, about you a couple nights ago. And, you're a lifesaver. I mean, a couple of years ago, a couple of years back at Honeymoon Island, I guess you're just you're just a lifesaver. I mean, can yeah, you yeah, go back yeah, that on was, that day there? I mean, that was sure, I was that, shocked. <laughs> I think that was uh, it's pretty early in my I want to say my after, right in my first year. Uh, I was on the wife with my or I was on the water with my my wife and my dogs, and we we heard a distress call, and we just uh, responded to that. It was it was that it wasn't that big of a deal, but uh, you know the the media found out, and it was it was actually during the NFL lockout, and uh, it blew up into a pretty big story. Oh, yeah, great timing, I guess, kind of on your part. I mean, obviously, great timing both in saving them, I guess, and media wise, yeah. you, you know, yeah, absolutely, a so, to the media. Yeah, I mean, it's just kind of when it was it was a little slow fishing. I think we were in between tides, and and we just had the radio on and and just tried to respond to it and. Uh, you know, we we pulled up and and there were some kids and their their kayak had flipped over and they were struggling. So we we pulled the boat, the kayak into the into our boat and uh, and pulled them into the boat and saved them. And if I'm not mistaken, you're also on a boat when you got drafted, correct? Yeah, yeah. Actually, a different boat, but uh, we we had gone. Out, I think it was the the third day in the draft. We went out and. We're just fishing, you know, super windy, and I, I got a call from the Patriots, and uh, answered that it was the old iPhone like one, which like had really really poor speakers, so you couldn't hear yeah. anything. And I was like trying to like cover my one ear up, and I, you know, so windy, so I was laying under the gunnel of the boat. Uh, but yeah, another kind of crazy experience. And what would your message be to like the later round draft picks this year and this year's draft? I think this year it's tough because. You know, the with the Corona, the, there's no off-season program. All the right. all the all the learning's done via video conference. So, I mean, you can't control that, but you can control how much you study and how much you work out on your own. So, I'm sure if those guys show up in shape and they know the playbook, that's about all they can do. But it's definitely going to put them at a disadvantage uh, compared to normal. Right. Ted, do you see the hype with this year's draft class? You know, all these experts saying how deep it is. You know, I, I'm not sure whether or not your draft class is as deep or, you know, how many pros have been, you know, long tenure. Do you believe in the hype that this year's draft class is just that good, I guess? Uh, I mean, it's it's tough to compare a college draft class that hasn't played, you know, any snaps, but I'm right. sure there's some, some talent in it. And <clears throat> My, I don't pay a whole lot of attention to college football, so it's tough for me to say. I can speak on, on my draft class, and, and in particular the class we had at the New England Patriots. It was a <clears throat> pretty deep class. We, I mean, we had Rob Gronkowski was in it. We had Aaron Hernandez. So it was a pretty wild draft class. But uh, of that class, I think just three people are still playing from that class. So, what I, mean, you- ten year, I mean, 10 years – that's a long time, and I think overall that class was successful. But uh, I, time will tell, you know, how how deep this class is in, in 2020. And obviously, knowing Tom Brady and Rob Gronkowski, what do you think about them two teaming up in Tampa Bay, where you once played? Yeah, I mean, it's interesting. It was interesting to see where 
Brady ended up and and then to pull Gronkowski out is kind of an interesting move. So, I mean, that's kind of, a I feel like, a feast or famine thing that might go really well. Uh, again, time will tell with that, but uh, I, th- I think it'll be interesting seeing those guys play in a new place, and it's definitely going to it's definitely get, get people to watch the Bucks games. Yeah, absolutely. Well, they'll certainly be getting, I mean, I'm not sure. I can't imagine attendance was that great. I always had my family going down to Tampa. You know, just for that that one game in December they play on the, you know, every other year I think it would be. But uh, speaking of Gronk, I mean, he was part of uh, what now has become the Miami miracle. And he was the last line of defense for us. Uh, Him taking a piece of the turf out. I don't know what the hell happened there with him. But you were, you know, a crucial block there on Pat Chung. I mean, seeing that play develop in, you know, even before the snap, even before that last kind of, you know, play, I guess. What was going through your head? I, I know that most of the time is just kind of, oh, let's see, let's try and think and dunk it down the end zone. But you see that play develop. Like, what is going through your head? Yeah, I mean, it's it's kind of a play that you practice. And, and you, you know, you you don't need it until you need it. And, and we were down in that situation where we had, like, seven seconds and had the ball around 30. So you, you try to just go out there and – and help help the guys that make plays make plays, and and whether that's throwing a block downfield or <clears throat> or getting the ball and pitching it yourself, you, you try to put yourself in a situation to make a play or to help someone make a play, and that's pretty much all that play came down to was, uh, you know, playmakers making a play, and then I made a block, and and, and we we kind of got lucky there, but that is a play a lot of teams practice and rarely succeed at. The block heard around the world. Was it <laughs> was it? Came to, when uh, Tannehill comes to the huddle, does he call like a hook and ladder, or what's he say? Just like try yeah. to break him loose. Yeah. Sure, there's there's a code word. I think it's something like Sports Center, or <clears throat> something uh, you know, in jest like that. But I mean, that is a it's a legit play, and there's different plays that every team works on. You know, for uh, where you are in the field and how much time, and, and teams spend a lot of time on clock management, especially that last you know two and a half two minutes of a game and. Or half, and you know, every week you're drilling plays, watching other teams do plays, and and trying to learn from that. So when, well, on TV it looked like the place went absolutely bonkers. Was it like the wildest like atmosphere at that point, or wildest moment you had been in at that point, or was it, or just kind of, oh, that was kind of cool, or you've been in sure, something no, like yeah. you know, much I mean, louder was, than that? It was, it was out of, I mean, it was obviously out of control because you don't. It's such a long shot winning it, thinking you're going to win the game like that. But I'd, I'd been in a similar play uh, when I was in Arizona. We were in a playoff game in 2015 against Green Bay where the game went to overtime. And, and Larry Fitzgerald made a couple great plays <clears throat> uh, to win the game. So, I mean, they were both crazy plays. It's both co- it's cool to have walk-off plays like that where the game just ends uh on on your record like that but uh i mean i guess playing 10 years you're kind of subject to a couple crazy plays like that we actually wanted to mention that cardinals game and that that whole 2015 season i mean you guys were that close um ultimately falling to the panthers in the uh, nfc championship game but like what was that season like you know it was one of the best seasons the cardinals had in recent recent history except for the super bowl season sure i mean yeah the uh, coming off 2014 2014 we were Nine and one, and uh, Carson Palmer got hurt, and then our backup quarterback got hurt. So I think we had a lot of uh, we were close that first year, and then next year, obviously, we made it to the NFC Championship. Uh, we didn't play as well as we would have liked in that game, uh, and actually, that year Todd Bowles left to be the head coach of the Green or the New York Jets. So it would have been interesting to see if he had stuck around, how well we could have played, and maybe we could have uh, shut down Cam Newton in that NFC Championship game, but. Uh, that was a fun run we were on and, and wish could have won uh, a couple more playoff games when we were there. Don, Justin and I have had, a, uh, I guess, a uh, short-standing rivalry of that Carolina Panthers team and whether or not they were quote-unquote pretenders or not. Absolutely, that year. we have. But I just want to get your say on that game. Um, were, were they that legit? I mean, I mean – I can't imagine that they weren't, you know, 15 and one making it the Super Bowl, just coming up short. I mean, from your experience in that game, were, were they the team to beat? Were they le- the legit team or did you guys really let that yeah. opportunity slip? Uh, 
Well, we definitely let it slip, but I think that we were unable to contain Cam Newton, you know, and Cam Newton was such a dominant player. You know, he was running their running all over the field really, but he was running their their goal line offense really well. No one could stop him on the goal line. We certainly couldn't contain him. We turned the ball over a bench. Uh, we were still as as poorly as we played in that game. Uh, I I watched the I think the NFL has some kind of a, a documentary on it. And we were actually we were about to get the ball right before halftime and, and Patrick Peterson fumbled fumbled the punt and that kind of was the the nail in the coffin that did us in. But we were down like ten points, still kind of could come back. And I think that was kind of the, the final nail nail in the coffin. But the the Carolina Panthers were a, a they had a great defense and we were unable to stamp, uh, stop Cam Newton. I think that's the difference between Denver in the Super Bowl and how how well they played against him. They made him be a pocket passer and, and they took away his feet. And you can see what kind of a passer he is when he, he's not able to use his weapons uh, and move around like that. And obviously seeing Cam Newton play, do you think he should be a starting quarterback for a team right now? Uh, it's tough to say. You know, it's, it's one of those things where he'll end up in the right situation, I'm sure, and and end up probably playing well. I think injuries are a tough thing to deal with when they expect you to be the starting quarterback and you've missed a large chunk of time you know and he's missed a lot of time with injuries lately so it's mm-hmm. it's you get a coaching change it's tough for them not want to move in a different direction yeah absolutely and when in that game against the packers and it was the 2015 season you know aaron Rodgers hits jeff janice on that wild hail mary what was going through your head on the sideline there yeah i mean i think we were up like two touchdowns even and kind of just the way they the year had gone with our defense we I was kind of joking with our right tackle, like this game, you know, isn't over. And he hits, he hit two, like almost hail marys. You know, we were, he was backed up almost to his. Um, yeah, on the on the goal line, right? Goal line, yeah, and throws about fifty yards, and then did the same thing into the end zone. So it was pretty unbelievable. You could kind of hear that the air get sucked out of that place uh, on those plays. But luckily, like I said, uh, Carson Palmer and, and uh, Larry Fitzgerald made some great plays, and we were able to come away with a win on that game. Yeah, he goes across the field. He, Carson Palmer hits Larry Fitzgerald across the field. He goes all the way like 70 yards and then end up getting a little flip past the score. It doesn't get much better than that, right? First drive yeah. of the Lord's. Exactly. Yeah. Well, I mean, he almost, if you watch the play, he almost got sacked. He like rolled out of a sack yeah. from, from Clay uh, Matthews and, and threw it to Larry, and who's always been kind of a clutch player, especially in the playoffs. Absolutely. And then, and then we ran that little sh- uh, shovel pass to him uh, and scored. It was so, I mean, it was almost like, I wasn't ready for us to win the game like that. So I don't know if I appreciate, like I just ran inside. I don't know if I appreciated it as much as I should have. So when yeah. a play like that Miami miracle happened, I was like, you know, like this, this is like a rare thing. So I'm going to really enjoy this. Yeah. And Larry Fitzgerald, so, obviously a first ballot hall of famer. Sorry, I didn't mean to cut you off. Nah, no obviously first ballot. Gotta be. I mean, he's a, a unbelievable career and, and the length of it and the quality of it. Yeah. He's, Top notch. Absolutely. So, Ted, obviously being a 10-year vet, you've seen your fair share of quarterbacks. I don't know how close you've been looking into this year for quarterbacks, but I brought up a point, uh, I think it was earlier in the week or earlier last week, how well, minus New England, I guess there's not that kind of, you know, uh, rotating door of quarterbacks for this year. Everyone's kind of starting to find their spot. What do you, What do you have to say? for the quarterback situation in the NFL, you know, past years we've seen so many quarterbacks come and go. Is this the year that we finally get, you know, stable quarterback room for most teams? Well, it's interesting because you, I think every year there's some shift and, and this year, especially, I mean, you look at uh, Philip Rivers went to Indianapolis, uh, you know, Andy Dalton, who had been a mainstay of, of the Bengals is gone and then they're going with the younger guy. So it's interesting to see some guys, uh, leave and and then the the new class come in i think there's a lot of good quarterbacks in this uh rookie class and and last year's rookie class with like kyler murray and this this next wave of guys but uh i think it'll be interesting to see what what happens with these vets on new teams you know (coughs) brady um and like i mentioned rivers how they do in a new a new building because if you you think about it they've been in the same building for 15 20 years it's right it's it's tough to adjust and and it'll be interesting to see how they do and 
uh, you think of like a guy like uh, Joe Montana or like a Michael Jordan toward the end of the career when they shift, does it kind of tarnish their um, their reputation or their their supreme level as such a as such an elite player? Do they elevate the players around them? And being a teammate of Ryan Tannehill, what were your thoughts on his wild run last year with the Titans last postseason? Obviously, he did Obviously. tremendous, right? Like, absolutely. I mean, he he did well. That team runs the ball really well, and and they kind of play towards his his strengths, you know, as a play action passer, and and they have a good defense, and and he stepped in and played really well for uh, from a backup role. So, I mean, it's, I'm interested to see what what he can do with the whole year. And he's obviously a tremendously talented quarterback. He's first round pick and got into some injury problems. And just mm-hmm. like Cam Newton, you know, he found a new home and, and, and ended up playing well. So, you know, obviously happy for him. Yeah. Do you think his star kind of was underutilized in Miami? Yeah. I mean, if you think about 2016, <laughs> the year before I got there, they, they were 10 and six and went to the playoffs. He, towards ACL that year and then did opted not to have surgery. So I think he maybe was trending upwards and then, and then 2017, he gets hurt in training camp. So to miss, you know, a year and a half, two years of football is tough. Um, and I think sometimes it's good for people to move on and, and go to a new, a new situation, you know, and they took the pressure off. He was the back of the quarterback and he was able to kind of find his groove again. Is that kind of all you think he needed really was a cha- uh, change of scenery? Yeah, I mean, he'd been really through like a out. he'd been through a tremendous amount of coaching changes, and right. and I think, to, yeah, to just move on and move to a new city might be uh, a good way to to shake things up and, and get a change. And you look at guys, and there's there's been situations like that where they were a first round pick, and and you kind of just remove them from that situation, and they end up playing really well. Yeah, you know, obviously. Uh, you know, the options start to roll out for quarterbacks this year, whether teams are picking up their options or not. You were you were in the room with Mitch Trubisky at one time in Chicago. Them not picking up his fifth-year option. I mean, this guy was supposed to be – he was built to be the franchise, I guess, kind of deal. But what are your thoughts on them not going with the fifth year, whether or not to, you know, re-sign him or, you know, let him say, hey, prove it and we'll talk later? Yeah. I mean, I think he doesn't – uh there's been too much inconsistency with that. Uh, you know, they did make some, they made some moves to, to move up in the draft. And he, even in college, I think he had a limited uh, resume, but <clears throat> I think the, the fifth year option, it's so pricey with those top five or 10 guys. I think it's something like 24 million or something. So he's still under contract and he's still under contract. I think for, is this year four for him? So maybe, yeah. Uh, I think they could, if, if he plays well, I think it's a win-win for the bears, you know, Either they they don't compound the problem that they had by not picking up the fifth year option, or or he plays well and they re-sign him and and everybody wins again. So I think it's an important year and there's a lot of pressure and I I don't know how big of a leash he's he's got with bringing in Nick Foles like they did. And what were your thoughts about the Bears bringing in Nick Foles? Uh, I guess it's you know someone that they'd had some experience with in Kansas City. Uh, Coach Nagy's worked with him and. He's proven winner. He won a Super Bowl, and running that same offense that the Bears runs in in Philadelphia. So, I think that they're kind of just hedging their bets. You know, they're Mitch hasn't made it through a whole year healthy, so they're kind of bring they they were going to bring in a vet, and they brought in a vet that that they have experience with, and that can uh, is a proven winner. Yeah. You know, playing with all these quarterbacks, journeymen, ultimately for you. Uh, is there any one guy that sticks out to you throughout your career, or is it just kind of like, oh, we had this guy this year and this guy this year really helped me out, or is it just you know one guy that's like, he he was a bro, he was he was he was my guy. Yeah, I guess it's different. I mean, early on, Josh Freeman was a great quarterback to play with. He he had some success when I was there, and <clears throat> just a great guy to be around, a great guy to be in the huddle. And then I go to Arizona, and Carson Palmer is just a tremendous kind of throwback quarterback as far as his attitude and, and he was slinging the ball around really tough guy. Uh, and then, and then Jay Cutler in Chicago, I know a lot of people have mixed opinions on him, but my time with him in Chicago and Miami were tremendous. So uh, yeah, Jay, 
Josh and um, and Carson were, were kind of my favorite quarterbacks I played with. And Jay Cutler, you know, you mentioned he kind of gets a lot of mixed emotions. Like, is he really this bad of a guy that people make him out to be? <laughs> I, I mean, I don't think getting a divorce is going to help that image of him. No. Um, <laughs> you know, uh, America's but, couple. Yeah, I mean, he's he's really he is an he is an awesome guy, and you know, I played with him in Chicago, and then I was lucky enough to to play with him in Miami, and uh, he really is just he's one of the guys. He's awesome. Likes to hunt. Likes to. Uh, to hang out with the guys. So uh, I think anybody that's played with him really can vouch for, for him as a quality dude and a, a tremendous, if I, almost underrated athlete. Did the uh, smoke and Jay meme ever make it to the locker room? Like, oh, Jay, look at this picture of you with a cigarette in your mouth. Did that, did that uh, ever make it mainstream for you guys? Or? Oh, it was definitely mainstream. I mean, yeah, he, I don't know that anyone like, brought it up to him but i mean it definitely we all knew about it we i mean i think he even threw it up on his instagram so uh he's definitely aware of stuff like that so he's a fun guy <laughs> oh for sure yeah i mean absolutely competitor and and you know love to talk trash to other teams so definitely a guy you can get behind now who do you think's a better trash talker him or philip rivers <laughs> i guess i mean that puts me in a little bit of conflict because philip rivers is an nc state guy Oh yeah, uh, but he's got the you know Phil Rivers is he's getting like some legit trash talking. I mean, I think he like lives yeah. for that. And I think back to when <coughs> you know he's trash talking fans a couple of years ago. Uh, I mean, I think he's got that he's got that wrapped up pretty good. I think he's a, he's a pretty elite level trash talker. Yeah, him and Richard Sherman, I just feel like are at the top tier there. Yeah, I mean Richard Sherman. I actually just saw a clip of. Of him trash talking uh, Trent Trent Williams and getting punched in the face. Oh, after yeah, yeah. And now yeah. that's teammates. How's that work yeah, out? That's exactly. It. Yeah, that's what it was about. So, yeah, I mean that's almost annoying. It's like uh, he's kind of built his career on successful career, but he's built it on on trash talking. With the whole crab tree after the <laughs> after the uh, the playoff game against San Francisco, and then yelling at the reporters. All oh, yeah, I mean him and Philip Rivers are up there. Yeah, I mean, then uh, he's definitely he put himself on the mainstream with that that play and and then the interview after. Yeah, you know, poor poor Aaron Andrews. But back to Chicago, I like you said you played with Jay. I mean, what what has been their problem after Jay? They just haven't really found. I mean, if you want to say Trubisky has been their guy, I mean, he kind of by default has been. But what has it been their problem bringing in you know big money Mike Glennon at that point? Chase Daniel too. What has been there? I mean, they signed into a, I wouldn't say huge contract. It was a pretty big contract. For her, yeah, for backup years guy ago. to bring him in. Yeah, that was a huge. And I think that was again just a flyer. You know, it's a. <clears throat> it was one year deal where. A lot of money in, in that one year, but they were kind of free of him the next. And and if he had played well when he had started, and he was mainly a backup in Tampa, so they bring him in, and I guess he think you know it's like if he plays well. Then he got him on the cheap, and, and if he doesn't, then he's gone. And that's kind of what happened. And I don't know that he ever had a legit chance to be that quarterback. You know, they drafted Mitch with the second or third pick of that year draft, and uh, I think Mike was happy to to make that that money when he was there. And and but I don't know that he ever had a chance to be that that franchise quarterback. And that was coming off of Jay. If you think about it, Jay had like five head coaches, five offensive coordinators when he was in Chicago. So a lack of continuity definitely hurts that place. But, uh, I mean, they've, they've definitely got a good defense. They can run the ball. So they're, mm-hmm. they're set up to, you know, where they might be able to make another run like they did in 2018. If it wasn't for that double doink, who knows what would have happened? <laughs> yeah, that was rough. I mean, I think that was rough for them to get over last year. They definitely, I mean, it was like day one. They, were, they showed that clip. Uh, and you know, it's one play, you know, there were a lot of other plays in that game that, you know, it doesn't have to come down to a field goal, but it is what it is. And, and I think they found some, a good kicker and, and Eddie and, and they were able to move on. He made some, some even a game winning kick last year. So again, against Denver, he had one. And yeah, then there was, sure. yeah. 
Yeah, pretty deep one. And um, obviously being drafted by the Patriots, was there one lesson that you really learned from Bill Belichick during your, it wasn't a long time with the Patriots, but during that time with the Patriots, is there one really thing that you learned from Coach Belichick that you really stuck with you? I mean, sure, there was all kind of like, you know, football lessons and stuff. But with, with that situation, it was just – it kind of <clears throat> let me know that how much of a business uh, professional sports are and, and that you can be drafted by a team and end up – um, cut a couple months later, and you know, luckily I was I was I was picked up by Tampa, but for me it, it kind of like that was my orientation in the league that hey, jobs aren't secure, and that you have to go out and compete and play well to keep your job or to get a job. Uh, so it, if anything, it kind of just let me know that the business aspect of it, and uh, you know, when I was able to get picked up by Tampa, I had a I had a fresh start. Even though you know I'd only been in New England a brief time, I had a fresh start and a, and a new outlook, and and I was I was kind of definitely head on a head on a swivel, uh, knowing that that the that that's a possibility. You know, coming from Florida, I believe you're just a couple hours north, if I'm not mistaken. But going down, getting like getting cut by the Patriots, and then you're like, oh man, what do I do? And Tampa's just right there to scoop you up. I mean. You being a rookie that at that point, was there anything better than going back home and playing for the hometown team? I I, I guess hometown team, but yeah, anything I mean, better than that? It, it, it was it was pretty much hometown. That was the team that I'd always watched growing up. So to go from a place in New England where it's like you're like the fifteenth guy in the O line room because there's so many vets and 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 you know, there's no windows in that facility and it's like you feel like an no, absolute like so- like a pawn, you know, you're just like what is going on this is miserable and then you get to go to the sun in florida and to go home and there's a level of comfort there and uh to go to a young team and we ended up being pretty good that first year yeah i mean it's tremendous it was like i said it completely changed my outlook it went from like oh i guess i'm done playing football to uh you know kind of give me a new lease on life so that was that was a huge thing for my career what did you think about the Miami Dolphins draft class this year? Obviously, being a Dolphins guy, uh, what did you think about it this year and their potential for the future? Yeah, I mean, they had I think like eleven picks and three first round picks. Uh, time will tell with to see how Tua does. I don't know. I mean, the guys had a pretty injury plagued college career, so if, the, if I would say if he does well, then that that whole place goes does well because every team's kind of powered by the quarterback my wallet's hurting from that two ago to the <laughs> dolphins i had him slip into the jaguars so it wasn't a good draft night for me yeah we'll wait and see i mean they had a ton of picks so obviously some of them are going to stick and and play well i think that they got a cornerback in the first round who's pretty good and i think yeah, a young offensive too. lineman yeah who so so you being from Florida, I want to ask, not really football related, how is everything like so far away from each other? Florida, it's just, I was down there for a couple of weeks uh, back in March. It seems like, you know, it's like, oh, we'll head to Tampa for a day. Like it's two and a half hours away. Like how is everything <laughs> like, how is everything so far away? I don't get it. Well, I think the thing that I noticed, like, so I live in Phoenix. I've lived here for about six years in the off season and uh, stuff's uh, far away, but the highways are so good. There's not much traffic. When I went back oh, to please. my That's yeah, another when, story. I, when I went back to Miami, it would be you know something might be five mi- miles away, but it's going to take you half an hour to get there. So like you, I used, I mean, when I'm in Phoenix, I think I go by like miles equals minutes. But when you're in somewhere like Florida, I mean, the, the highways are overloaded. Uh, there's way too many high rises and way too many people in such a small place. So it's definitely, I mean, and, and the thing about people in Florida, like you said, they don't mind driving two or three or four hours. Me and my wife always kind of joke about that with uh when i signed with miami my my parents are still like four hours away but they had no problem driving that four hours down to miami to see a game yeah like i mean it doesn't get much worse than up up uh, your friends up north here in uh, massachusetts with roads and people but uh, oh, yeah. obviously during the pandemic here it's been radio silent ultimately but uh yeah those roads down in florida man it's a world of difference just smooth sailing all the way i i I was shocked. I was it was my first time driving down there. I was just I was just in shock. Like, oh my god, we haven't hit a pothole or a bump yet. Like this is unheard of. Yeah, but, uh, I mean, and uh, yeah, I, I can't imagine that. 
uh, those people are paying attention to the pandemic rules from what I've seen. That place is still like a madhouse. Uh, but I know, I know here it's been, I've definitely appreciated the lack of traffic. Uh, it's been easy to get around to kind of all hours of the day. Now, I know you're an outdoorsman, so is that one thing you are missing in Phoenix, the fishing? Absolutely. You know, I, I have, I had two boats and I just sold one pre, pre-corona, I like. I like to say, but uh, so I definitely, yeah, that, my time in Florida and Miami, with, uh, I, I enjoyed being out on the water. So that's, I definitely missed that. I actually, I did have a fishing trip in February to, I went down to Chile to do a little fly fishing. Oh, so right. I try to get it in when I can. We, I actually just had a fishing turn to myself yesterday. I won by catching one fish, a little small sunfish, but it'll do. Really? Oh, that's funny. Oh, yeah, it'll do. <laughs> Yeah, I mean, all, I like all kinds of fishing. I mean, saltwater fishing is obviously number one if I can do it. But, you know, I like going into the, to the lake, you know, down the street, catching a bass and, and any kind of sunfish like that. I mean, down in Florida, I mean, we, we went on one of the jet ski tours. You see all the wildlife. I mean, Florida is a really cool spot. And what made, made you make the jump to Arizona? Was it family based? Was it just this is where I want to, you know, start my brand and I want to have my property and I can just get all kinds of property for short money ultimately. Or what was it? What was the, you know, the jump? I mean, two different sides of the, the, you know, United sure. States, I guess. Yeah. Well, so I, I'd signed a, a contract to play here after I left Tampa. And so we were kind of looking just for a home base and Arizona, we, we really kind of fell in love with <laughs> in the off season. It's, fantastic weather and it, it's it, i always think florida is a pretty nice place to be but you know you get those days where it's rainy and, and windy and we really enjoy the weather in phoenix it's sunny almost every day hardly ever rains so uh and now you know i've got my kids i've had both my kids here and, and we've been here for six years it's kind of become home uh while while i'm in the nfl so yeah we, we love it and it gets a little hot in the summer but uh, the, the dry heat is a little easier to manage than the humidity down in Florida. And kind of back to the football front. I mean, you're still a free agent here. Have you had any kind of any kind of interactions with team or any bites? Sure, yeah. And I think it's been a, a weird year for vets. I mean, if you look at it, a lot of vets are still out on the market. Uh, and I think that's just – I don't know why that is exactly. But if anything, I think that the veteran market – it will pick up and should be a little more robust when you think about the experience level of these rookies and, and the lack of experience and how long this thing goes. I mean, it might be if, if there's limited training camp, it's going to definitely affect the development of the young players and the rookies where they, you know, might almost have that red shirt type year. And, and you might want someone with a little more experience who can pick up the offense and, and has been, uh, been proven to, to be a, a, a player and competitor and, and somebody who's been in those situations. So uh, kind of, we'll see what happens with that, but you know, I expect stuff to pick up here pretty good. And do you think that teams kind of drafted with like previous collegiate coaches saying like guys kind of favored teams that had like better coaches due to like, due to not having an off season program? Yeah. I mean, it, it's interesting. You know, I think I saw like LSU, for example, who had played in a bunch of playoff games and I think their whole offense, or maybe their whole team, got drafted. I know their whole oh, offense. All of them, right? <laughs> yeah. So, yeah, I think you, you look at teams that have, have played a little more football and have a little more experience, and then you the 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 young, you know, the the guys you might take a flyer on, maybe you postpone that towards uh, till next year or something. But I would definitely think teams would be thinking about that and and knowing that these rookies aren't going to have OTAs and training camp and and all the time to to get ready like they like they normally do. So, you know, go, during quarantine, I get away from football here. But what, what have you really been up to? Has it been hikes? Has the weather been? I obviously we're not paying the closest attention to weather down in Arizona. But well, didn't they have a giant heat wave or something? <laughs> it's been in the past week. It's been pretty warm. I mean, it's been 105, 106. Wow. <laughs> oh, my God. So, I mean, it, it's supposed to be in the 90s, I think. But we've been hiking, been in the pool. I'm big into mountain biking. <clears throat> pretty good man and, and the good thing is there's been no one around you know i mean it's like it's almost too hot where guys people don't want to be around uh but i've also been busy so i actually had i graduated in 2009 
but I, I went, I was close to finishing another major. And so I've been kind of spending my semester doing, taking a bunch of classes. I think I've taken like, I don't know, by the time the summer will be over, I would have taken like nine or 10 classes and to finish this uh, economics degree because uh, truth be told, my GPA was not fantastic in my original <laughs> undergrad yeah. sub. And I've gone back and I'd, I'd like to apply to go to business school, I'd like to go to a top uh, graduate school when I'm done playing. So I'm like, I'm using this time to uh, to boost my GPA and 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 get a, get a decent degree. And so I've been pretty busy with with the school stuff. But that's uh, kind of wrapping wrapping up with this spring semester is almost over. And and uh, <clears throat> I just got a couple more classes this summer, and I'll, I should be all done with it. And back to kind of the school thing, you were recruited as a defensive lineman by NC State, correct? Yeah, and I played D line for the majority of my career there. And what kind of like made you make the switch? Was it like was it one certain thing? Would they need offensive players? Yeah, I mean they. Had, uh, <clears throat> I think we had a coaching change. New staff came in, and they uh, different style of defense than I was playing, and they knew I was athletic and strong and could make an impact on offense. I think that it was uh, Tom O'Brien and their staff had had some success moving guys from defensive line to offensive line at Boston College. So I think that's kind of just what they were thinking with me. And and it worked out for me. There was another guy actually played defensive line with J.R. Sweezy, who who ended up, he's still in the, in the, in the league. And he's, he made the switch to offensive line a little later than me. But uh, I mean, it's, for an offensive lineman, if you're not a, a crazy talented athlete, it's kind of a no-brainer because to, to play D-line, you have to be strong, you have to be fast. So if you can take those traits over the offensive side of the ball, it, it'll definitely help you out. And now, be, being a lineman myself, you know, the bond between linemen is not, not, nothing like it. Nothing like it. Does that carry on to the pros? Is it just like they're just an unbreakable bond? Oh, sure. I mean, especially even being in the, in the line room, it's uh, a tremendous group of guys usually, you know, and egos are removed and you can just shoot the shit and that's kind of what it's all about. And, and that's what I think guys are missing right now. You know, usually we're busy with OTAs and and can just kind of shoot the braids with people and, and hang out on the weekends. So the guys are definitely missing that aspect of it. So going towards, you know, your schooling right now, I mean, it seemed like you are, you got everything wrapped up to say, you know, you, you got everything figured out. Coming to life after football, what is the plan with all these majors? What's the next step? I mean, obviously, it seems as if you have a lot left in the tank. You're just waiting for that one phone call, which I'm sure is, you know, Bound to come, but what what is, what is the plan with all these uh, with all the school time logs boosting the GPA, getting yeah, these degrees? I mean, what is the plan? I'd like to, I'd like to apply to uh, <clears throat> graduate school to go to get my MBA. So it's a pretty competitive uh, process. So that's why I'm trying to help myself out with uh, the boosting the GPA right now uh, to get ready for that application. And that'll probably come in in probably two years. I'll I'll probably take the the GMAT uh, next year, and then apply uh, either next year or the, the following year. I've had a couple of buddies who have retired and they've had success uh, applying and, and even some finishing graduate school. And I think it'll just kind of fill in the gap of, so for me, I've played 10 years in the NFL and I've had a ton of experience with the competitive situations and leadership. And I think just filling in that kind of that business uh, aspect that I haven't been as privy to is, and kind of filling in those gaps in, in my uh education is kind of what i'm what i'm aiming for and then from there i'm not really sure so I'm, I'm trying to be as prepared as i can going into make that transition because it comes fast and we'll see what happens do you have like a desired location of teams that you'd want to go to or at this point is it kind of you'd go anywhere yeah at this point yeah. for me it's i'm not uh super concerned with where i mean ideally you go to a team that uh is going to play well you know and, and you know, you know yeah they're not tanking uh <laughs> but really you look you look at a team where you can contribute uh where you might have a chance to play a little bit and where you can uh you can hopefully make that team you know that obviously you go to a team where uh there is a, a spot for you so definitely some stuff you look at like that absolutely that tampa area code comes on the phone 
I mean, they, they still got some empty spots on that line to help TB12 out there. I mean, are you on the first sure, plane yeah. over there, e- even in the midst of all this? Are you in that, are you on that plane? I think my wife, my wife might be remiss to be that close to my family, but uh, like a job is a job kind of thing. And, <clears throat> you know, I, I have experience. I still have my family that lives in that area, and I have experience with uh, Bruce Arians is there now. And that whole staff. So there is some carryover from the the Cardinals. So I mean that's the, I mean I was close to actually going there last year uh, if I didn't go to Chicago. So yeah, that's I mean that's a possibility, and I'm not opposed to going anywhere probably. And have you had any contact with Bruce Arians? Uh, you know, there's people on the on the staff that I've, I'm still friends with. So yeah. I speak to the I'm a, uh, I, I I'm in contact with those people, but. Uh, yeah, I mean, Bruce has, has made a resurgence. You know, he took a year off, did some TV, and I think he, he kind of fell into the right situation in Tampa. So it's, I think with, they're kind of building a good thing there. And he, he got a, a veteran quarterback who is going to allow him to do some of the things he likes to do. So real quick from us, I, I know you just mentioned how Bruce Arians went over to TV uh, this offseason. Uh, TV, the big talk has been uh, Tony Romo cashing out. I mean, has that been something that, like, uh, you know, you're not the you're not the fondest of going to TV and you know him getting a ton of money? But is this something you'd want to look into if you know if the opportunity would come up? Because it, it seems like all these a lot of NFL players have gone over and been very successful. Even Gronk for the cup of coffee he had on Fox, you know, and us being yeah, broadcast but- guys, has that been something that you've ever thought of or? Uh, I mean, I think it's a great option. You know, some guys are super comfortable in front of the camera and they've got a lot to say. I don't know if I've I, kind of my career has been like I started off in New England. So it's like, say less, like say nothing. <laughs> so, like, uh, some guys like love talk ball. Like I played with Dan Orlovsky, who does a great job for ESPN on ESPN. Oh, and I think he's even yeah. he's being contributed or uh, he might contribute on Monday Night Football. He does, he does a great job. He's smart and, and well put together with everything. So some guys uh, do do well with that and kind of fall into it. And then, uh, you know, I talked to Kyle Long this morning. He said he's he might be doing some some broadcasting stuff, too. He's another guy that, you know, loves talking. And he does he's always streaming. He's always kind of in that medium. Uh, so for me, I think uh, like a radio thing, I don't know. I mean, I know radio isn't what it, what it once was, but, uh, you know, going forward, I think, whether it's college, going back to Raleigh uh, and, and having some kind of a, a college thing there or something in uh, Chicago would be would be cool. And I think uh, <clears throat> I think it's a great way to kind of immerse yourself in that, build your network, and also at the same time kind of stay connected to that uh, that fan base and that city. And do you have like one specific moment in your career where it is your favorite career uh, career moment in the NFL? Uh, I mean. I've played on, played on a lot of teams that aren't they're, they're not a, haven't won a lot of games. So for in those years when uh, I think about all the games we've won and going to the playoffs, uh, I've only been to the playoffs twice in Arizona. So going to the playoffs for me was was pretty huge, and especially when you're able to win a playoff game. So that 2015 season uh, stands out. <laughs> it's also the same year my my daughter was born. So it was a it was a pretty awesome year, uh, winning winning all those games and and becoming a father. And is there a big, big difference between playoff atmosphere and like a regular season atmosphere is, or is it overhyped a little bit? Oh no, that's real. I mean, that's like the jump from college to the NFL. Almost like, it's like a whole nother tier of games, you know, cause you're definitely not playing for the money cause the paychecks relative to the regular season are, are, are smaller. So, but the the option of of going home or, or moving on to the next round of the playoffs, I mean, that's a huge incentive, and, and the games are absolutely more intense. Absolutely. So, you guys getting that close in Arizona? You know, the two times that you made it to the playoffs uh, and coming up short to Carolina. Can you recall? You know, the locker room. You know, obviously, any sport. I've heard many stories of how they're like. They are a grown man crying, you know, knowing that they might not ever get back to that part of the mountain. Were you kind of on the emotional side? Were you kind of like, well, hey, you know, we, we played, that's what happened, and this is life? Or is it kind of 
you know, what was the feel of the locker room and, you know, what were your, what was your status at that point? Yeah, they were, I mean, the locker room is for sure uh, dejected and because it's kind of like you're building and building all through training camp and the off season and the season and then it kind of just, I mean, that's how the season normally just ends, but then to go to the playoffs and to go deep and to be one game from the Super Bowl, it just ends. That's, that's a rough place to be. And so the locker room was super dejected, but you're always thinking like next year, like we'll carry this over to next year. And I, I didn't go back to Arizona and they didn't have nearly the, the same success. So <clears throat> like you said, it is tough to get back to that place, but it's, the end of the season, no matter where you are, it's, it's tough, but especially when you've been in the playoffs. Uh, it's almost like at that point, you're like, well, I wish I wouldn't have even gone to the playoffs because I wasted all this time for nothing. It's like right. you're you know, working towards the Super Bowl and then that would just taken away uh, that close. It's it's tough and, and different people deal with it different ways. Now, that, that was my next question. It, people say all the time, like, oh, I'd rather lost in this game than the Super Bowl. I'd rather lost in the wild card game than the Super Bowl. Is, is that true or is that just kind of like, a homer being like, oh, oh, thank God my team didn't lose in the Super Bowl. You know, is that is it that kind of idea? Well, I can only speak from experience, and I can imagine like, so like, say you go like two, you know, two weeks in the playoffs. That's two weeks of your off season that you don't get, and <laughs> if you get blown out in that second round, it's like, dude, I wish like we had just gone home, right? right like right, I right. had to practice and like, but I can't imagine going to the Super Bowl and losing that would just be like terrible because we went to the nfc championship game and lost and it was terrible so i can only imagine if you go to the super bowl and lose and that's like i mean i don't know that's like five weeks after the season the five weeks that you i don't know if you want to say wasted but you, you just the season's over so the, there's really only one team that ends the season happy right like the team that wins the super bowl so you can go all the way to the super bowl and lose and and still have a shitty feeling. That's a that's a rough thing to deal with. Kind of another guy you played in Miami with in Miami, Devontae Parker. And what do you think about his potential to be a great receiver in the league? Yeah, I mean, I think he's got all the potential in the world. And he, again, a guy who's had a bunch of injuries and it was a little soft. And you see they didn't pick up his fifth-year option. So they kind of put him on notice. And they had a coaching staff change and and he picked up the new offense well and had a uh, record or like I guess for him a career year they signed their long-term deal now it's like that shows you the power of not picking up with your option that shows you <clears throat> the power of a new fresh start too I think uh see obviously he's a tremendous player and he he's got a chance to have a good career and wait and see if he can have the same type of year he had last year you know, lined it down here. I appreciate all the time you've given us. But back to Miami, I mean, the AFC is is as even as it's ever been in the past, you know, decade, two decades here. Does over Miami, if they don't go with Tua or Tua isn't healthy, whatever it may be, does Fitz Magic, is he able to take that team to a first place first place spot? I mean, I think he's he's a he's he's had some experience playing in, in the playoffs and uh, I think he could. I mean, he he's played well when he's had the chance to play. I don't know if he's still there under contract, but uh, I mean that's definitely an option. I don't I don't know how that would all play out. That's kind of an interesting way to to put it. But uh, yeah, that's that's something I hadn't given much thought. And again, like he said, thank you so much for the time you've given us. I just want to throw out one more thing. So back in December, I talked to Dan Copeland, who was a former Patriot. I actually bumped into at some fan. We were just kind of talking, and he said that Seattle and Miami were the toughest places to play. Where, in your opinion, are the toughest places to play? Yeah, Seattle for sure is tough because the noise is so loud. I would have to say – I've played in Miami and I've played in, in Tampa, so you're used to heat. I can see how that's also a tough thing. But for me, it's like Denver. Denver, the altitude is like a legit home field advantage, I think, that is uh, under-talked about. You know, it's tough and <clears throat> to play a game at you know 5,000 feet in the air is tough, and it definitely makes a difference. It makes it harder to breathe, right? Absolutely, yeah. The air's popping and stuff running out of the tunnel. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, you're just like, oh, my God, why am I so tired? Yeah, I'm so winded, so tired. 
that's me on any day when I go for a walk. Like, man, I, just, I can't believe I just went outside. Right? <laughs> yeah. So imagine if you, you were in shape and you, you show up and you're like, oh, God, what is going on? But, uh, yeah, I appreciate it. Thanks for having me on. And I, I wish you guys good luck with going forward. Yeah, and thank you so much for coming on and giving us so much time. This ran a lot longer than I expected, but we appreciate it a lot. Thank you so much. Absolutely. Absolutely. No problem. And we'll be chairing for you. All right. Take care. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.